Brendan, this is Alex Lai here in the front row. Uh, Alex is the DBA, and I'm the uh, developer and assistant DBA uh, on the OMI science support team at Goddard Space Flight Center. And we're going to talk about monitoring ozone levels with Postgres SQL. So uh, I'm going to begin by giving just a little bit of background. And Alex will talk about how data is um, brought into the system during a, a process we call ingestion. Uh, Alex is going to go over some of the challenges that uh, we faced. And then I'll describe some ongoing development in the software platform that affects how we manage the data. So uh, about 450 miles above the Earth's surface is a formation of satellites that are in a polar orbit that takes them across the equator uh, 14 times each day. And they call that uh, formation the A-Train. And uh, all of the members in the A-Train are Earth-observing satellites, so they've got their instruments pointed downward instead of outward. The caboose in this A-Train, uh, you can probably just barely see it here, is a satellite called Aura. Launched in July 2004, Aura has four different instruments for uh, monitoring Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the ozone monitoring instrument is uh, an instrument for monitoring stratospheric ozone levels, and that's our instrument, the one that provides us data for our system. Because these guys are in a, uh, uh, a polar orbit and they go over the North Pole each time they go around the globe, uh, the data is received at a far north of, uh, uh, ground station, uh, like this one in uh, Svalbard, Norway. Now, uh, the data is processed a little bit at the ground station and converted into something called an Earth Science Data Type, or ESDT. This is not really the sort of data type that you would normally encounter in a database. It's uh, really more like a procedure for uh, processing a set of measurements. And uh, they're defined by Earth scientists, which I'm, I'm not an Earth scientist, uh, but they provide sort of the, the raw uh, interface between uh, the data coming in from the satellite and our data management system. And right now, there's more than uh, 900 that have been defined that we have to, um, to store in the, in the database. So the, uh, uh, these ESDTs are, uh, get processed and are, and are generated. And the ultimate goal is that the atmospheric scientists will use them to uh, use the, the results of all this processing to create uh, uh, atmospheric profiles and uh, climate change models. So, so Alex is now going to tell you a little bit about the process of how the data gets in and uh, and processes. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Um, here's, um, I want to show this diagram to have a high level of the, the system on the processing system. As you see in the in the box, uh, you see the data provider period slide showing the, the ground system capture all the data coming down and will be either send the raw data to, to us uh, or they do some processing certain level of data and those are the provider of the data. And they will get into our input to our, our data processing system and also uh, we have a large, a large group of the scientists community and rely on our, our output data to, to feed into the application and doing research. Uh, those uh, scientists will, will go through as a user, go through the web interface to making requests and the data get delivered to the data receiver. And our OMI project uh, operator also have to go through our, can go through our web interface to monitoring our processing and uh, also submitting job through the planner and 
see what kind of data need to need to be. Sometimes we need to reprocess data or any new product come in or some uh, sign is changing the logic to how we manip manipulate the input data and come out with the final product and full, full the web interface. And this diagram is showing, um, as, as you know, that uh, the data basically have two ways to store the data. The real data will not store in the database. Uh, like the image or all the, all the instrument capture data will be stored in the archive system. Those are, the da data is a very high volume. And the other type of data we will uh, after process and they will store in the metadata server. In the, that's how the, the PostScript uh, um, cap capture tracking all the, the metadata uh, in our system. Um, there are two ways uh, will trigger the, the ingest process. Uh, Either through the auto ingest, which is rely on the arrival of the new data, uh, we have a logic to checking uh, daemon checking any any incoming file uh, show up in our our archive node, and then that will trigger the ingest process, and based on certain criteria, we set to doing the process of those data. And also, the OMI operator also can uh, submitting any job and controlling the ingest. We can override and seeing the planner and seeing the load. And also, we'll be able to also submitting job that way. And those are, well, maybe I need to explain a little bit more about our, our ongoing situation. Um, we're using Postscript almost uh, over 10 years uh, uh, to, to tracking all the metadata uh, in our legacy system. Um, back in a few years ago, we uh, realized that that is a, uh, the, the data schema need to be redoed. So we are starting, all, uh, starting another new development server, uh, which you see in the, in the down in the the corner, lower corner, the MDX is a new system, ongoing development system. And basically, um, that system already partially in operation. Uh, some application already uh, pointing to, to that. And the idea is we need to have uh, the metadata update uh, on both systems. But uh, the basically, that the par a priority is make sure that legacy system is ongoing is without losing any data. So we're based on that. Once we update in the metadata, uh, legacy metadata, and then we'll be, another trigger will go into the MDX uh, metadata server. Um, however, we, we do, from time to time, we do uh, have a little bit problem Seen that are there any reason that we didn't uh, successfully have 100% of all the data get into MDX uh, metadata? So that's why you see a box on the synchronized database process. We're trying to uh, catching any missing, any, any uh, problem, uh, file haven't successfully ingested in both systems. Yes? Uh, can you can you repeat it again? Yeah, so the data is coming through in this process, and we're also syncing the database process from legacy system. Are they writing the same? They uh, uh, no, there are two databases. There are, uh, is two different databases. It's not the same database. The schema is a little different between the two. Yeah, I, I'm going to show you more uh, in the following slide. Uh, this is well, one of the challenges we are facing, you know, trying to um, updating the, the basically same kind of metadata, but 
in different format of the schema. They are totally different. We are uh, a different petition, uh, all this uh, uh, have, have different. So I'm going to show you later. Um, in, the, in the thing I, I want to talk about besides the synchronization, this is one of uh, um, a backup uh, a synchronous uh, a replication. We are, right now, uh, this strategy we are using. Um, I want to talk about the history about um, before we running uh, NIO, uh, we were uh, running a, um, we still having no replication that time. We are pretty much based on based on the PG dump to do the backup. Uh, see now data getting very big and take time to doing the dump, and also um, and also the performance will drop while doing that. That time we only have one server, and and also uh, after the dump and the, the data ongoing update and. Between the first dump and the second dump, that window we are pretty much if the the, the database crash, then we're losing those data, and uh, the replication I/O is uh, really help us to uh, solving this problem. We at least we have a uh, uh, standby database and uh, a little bit better, um, but uh, we still continue to do uh, the dump, but the less frequent frequency dump, and also we dump the, uh, from the slave. And it won't causing our, our performance in the master. I, I just want to mention some some of the sharing some experience on the the thing we we are focused on, um, how to make sure the replication successfully. Uh, we uh, this is this is a kind of uh, area that possibility of the. The wall file did not apply properly, and then can can cause the replication fail. So um, between the the master and slave, sometimes the network is unavailable for a period of time. We have to uh, get notice about that, and so and also a possibility uh, SA may may deleting some wall file didn't aware of. And you see in the previous slide, we have a PG dump uh, going on. Those is a copy, uh, can take a longer, longer period of time to finish. While the replication going on, seeing we are, we are dumping from the slave. And they have some coordination need to be done. I'm going to show you some parameter. We are just to avoid uh, the fail, complete the, the PG dump while the replication going on. Actually, this parameter showing is a um, the max the max uh, uh, standby streamline delay. We set it to one to make sure um, replication is in the way stay until the PG dump finish. That avoiding the the crash crashing our, our PG dump. We we have some technique to uh, you based on the PG uh, PS uh, operating system to showing uh, the status and uh, how uh, when the replication going on we uh, we are kind of monitoring those status and if they have too too long a period of wait and we uh, notice uh, something is going on uh, the performance may have a little bit problem so we are trying to trying to have some tool, automated tools, based on those information uh, to alert the SA and uh, DBA. And we are also using the log and uh, capture some information there in case we need to troubleshooting the period of time, the performance issue. And also uh, in the, in the PostScript built-in uh, table, system table, you have those information, and also we can uh, use those query uh, to create uh, how the the log apply, and if they are not move on certain period of time, we also get alert and things like that. 
And that's a very helpful uh, query uh, table, system table will help us to monitor. And those are some kind of uh, thing we also are aware of that make sure um, our wall file in, is in archive in case we need to rebuild or restore and also uh, make sure we don't purge uh, the wall file before actually uh, the slay applied it. And, uh, and we, we pay extra attention to those, uh, um, those disk space. And also the monitoring the waste day, how, how long the thing, and, and also monitor any deadlock situation happen. And that's a, just an email uh, we've been using to alert. Um, we haven't have any pager, and uh, we try to not work 24 hours. So we don't implement that. And because of, uh, because of our cell, uh, getting all the data, uh, input data, we always in an archive server. The worst scenario, we can always go back and reprocessing those data can be re reproduced. This is just a, uh, some, some note about the performance issue. And how, mu how much the data we have. And uh, currently, we, we, we have uh, about 10 cluster of the server. We, in different um, stage of the development, we have, uh, we have the development ser server, and we have test server, we have operation server. And on average, uh, it can be uh, 200 commit per second. Sometimes can hit up to 10,000. It depends on the workload. This is the average. Um, and also, uh, I, I counting is very difficult to measure. They have, they don't have a really uh, the standard. We, we, we measure how big your database, and this is how I, you know, sub, some indicator how how big. Uh, I just want to show you. Uh, the one of the biggest table, we got 160 million row, and the, the growing rate is about 40, 60 percent the last three years. And I just have some chart, you know, this is the legacy system we have. Uh, 2012, we already growing, I think, is maybe expecting more. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to pre predict the growth. And especially, uh, suddenly we may have a, a new provider join. They suddenly want to reprocessing uh, 10 years of data. They can suddenly uh, handful of data we have. So it's, it's just, uh, um, just, just trying to uh, scale our system, uh, see if we can handle that kind of load. Uh, There's a new system. Um, that is a bigger challenge I already mentioned about synchronize that, you know, between you see uh, the, it's a very cumbersome and also the, because the, the ongoing update the data um, make it uh, difficult to, you identify 160 million row of data, which one is the new one, uh, if we are, and also which one is different when we are trying to do synchronize uh, uh, the script, uh, trying to identify, identify is like the, the hardest part to, to synchronize. Once you find out which one you need to synchronize, it's easy. And uh, that is, uh, we're still working on trying to find a better way, maybe uh, trying to see any, any audience can, you know, suggest a better way if you have different schema, how to do a synchronization. Uh, you see this is the legacy schema, you know, I'm not going to go through any detail, but just just show you the new one will be simplified, but basically uh, partition the data in different table and things like that. And the, um, when, when I write it, the synchronization script is pretty much have to mapping the two different schema and, and trying to um, uh, find the right query to 
to, to update the missing data in the new system. <coughs> Some of the parameters I just want to show you. Uh, I'm not, this list is not showing uh, the complete list of uh, the, the configuration in the PostScript uh, config file. I just want to put in the table, you know, side by side, easier to identify. If it doesn't, may be helpful for the beginner. Never use a replication, may be helpful. You know, the, the, the certain parameter, you know, in master and slave are uh, different. And uh, uh, probably you can read that. It's uh, very straightforward. And PGCon have a lot of uh, pretty document. have a lot of very detailed information. And uh, as you as I pointed out before, that uh, we make an adjustment for because of the PG dump thing. We put in minus that. Um, what well, the trade off that the slide during the, the during the dump will not be in the real time, which is uh, it doesn't matter for us. Our case it doesn't need to be 100% real time in our slave. We're using a slave pretty much for 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 the backup purpose and also. Some long query, uh, read, read, a select query doesn't need to update. We're hitting our, uh, our slave to offloading, uh, the, uh, offloading the load from the master. That helps us to, to boot up uh, our performance in the master. And this is a, some other permit, parameter we're using. Um, that's it for me. And Hand it back to Marty. So I, I'm one of the developers that's been working on the rewrite of, uh, of our processing platform. And the, some of the decisions that were made in that rewrite uh, affect the way that we uh, are going to manage the data from here on out. And so I wanted to go over some of those things. Um, the, the big difference in, in the new platform is that uh, we're doing a lot of decentralized kind of components so that instead of having a, a more monolithic design, we broke it all out. And uh, these are web components like component X, Y, and Z here. And uh, where it was appropriate, we also splintered a little piece of the database off and integrated that in with its uh, component application. And then these guys communicate with each other uh, using REST. So, and uh, I, I'm not sure if everyone here knows, I wasn't quite sure what to expect in the audience. It's uh, our first PGCon, uh, so I don't know how many people are developers. But REST is you know, basically using uh, standard HTTP request in order to um, interact with a web application. And there's uh, three parts or three things that I think are interesting to mention on how this new architecture affects the data management. And one is, uh, concerns the web framework, and one concerns the ORM that's integrated in, and uh, the other is uh, the system of database patches that we've implemented for doing schema updates. So I'll go over each one of these three. Uh, the web framework uh, is, of course, just something uh, that helps to facilitate creating uh, a web application. In our case, we're using uh, Perl's Mojalicious framework. And Mojalicious implements a model view controller uh, paradigm where, of course, the view is what the, the user sees. In this case, it's a web page. Um, the model is a state of the system or, or the database uh, most often. And the controller is kind of a mapping in between uh, the interactions that the user uh, sends in through the view to do something on the model. And here at the bottom, uh, you can see here's some example mappings of uh, URLs. Again, so this is REST, so we're using um, uh, URLs for the users to do the interaction. They're sending in some sort of HTTP request, and that eventually has an effect on the database. And so uh, in this example, we've got uh, a get request, which maps to uh, a select statement on a person table. And we have a, a, a post request, which would map to uh, um, an update or an insert statement on, on the same table. And a delete, which would just map onto a delete. Um, and 
Uh, that's all pretty standard, I guess, for a web framework. The thing that's a little interesting about, about our system is uh, we've extended Mojalicious a bit so that uh, when this, the web server starts up, it automatically um, uh, recognizes the database that it's coupled with. So it's, it, it'll find out if it has a, an associated database, uh, check the database for all the tables, and it, it'll generate all these URLs or routes that are, that are used by a, a web application to do the, the basic CRUD operation. So you don't have to manually define all these things. Uh, the, the new architecture also has an integrated ORM. Uh, and of course, that's an optic relational mapper. I'm sure everybody here knows that. And similar to the web framework, we've done some things to, uh, to help automate um, uh, the operations that the ORM does. So as the server starts up, uh, the ORM kicks in and also reads the config file. And we'll try to discover the, the, the database as well. And uh, the ORM will generate the object methods needed for those uh, CRUD operations. So we, we've basically got two levels of, um, of database operation mappings going on here. So the, the web server uh, starts up, and the web framework is going to generate um, uh, a lot of routes, a lot of URL type routes that uh, a user would use, or the application that the user is using is going to use. And these then uh, make use of the object methods generated by the ORM, which can then go about um, manipulating the database on the back end. And so a lot of this happens just kind of magically. Uh, for whenever you create a new application with this framework and you define your database, all these methods and routes just get instantiated for you. Now that, um, uh, I'll, I'll say one thing, that can be a little expensive. So uh, if the database is any size at all, um, you know, it's going through all these tables, generating um, all, all the CRUD operations that would be needed to manipulate that. But luckily, since this is a, a web application, it does it all at, when the server starts up. So we only pay the price one time. And so far, it hasn't been too much of a problem. So uh, since we're doing sort of distributed development, lots of little components that can be um, developed individually, uh, it was desirable to have a way that uh, developers could um, create schema changes as they're working on the component. Because remember, these components now, these web applications, have the database tightly integrated in there, their own PostgreSQL database in there. So what we did uh, was, in addition to the code in, our, in the Git repository for the component, we added um, the schema definition file in this base.sql file. And then as you make, uh, or as, as, uh, as changes are made to the schema of the database, uh, developers add patch files uh, very much in the same way that you might add a patch to software code. You add a, a, a DDL patch here. And so uh, new patches come in and they're, uh, they're committed to the repository. Eventually you want to uh, migrate these things out to a running instance of component X or, or uh, more exactly you want to migrate them out to the the database that's running uh, within component X. And um, the software is going to do a little bit of help into maintaining the um, enforcing integrity on these patches to make sure things don't uh, get, a, get crazy on that. They, these slides got a little mangled. I'm sorry. Um, so let's imagine that you have a new patch that comes in here. So they've, they've added patches. And as a patch is added to the Git repository and tested uh, during the, 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 the process of, of testing it and committing it to the repository, the schema definition file is rebuilt. It's regenerated to incorporate all the patches that have come uh, later. And an entry is made in this text file called patchesapplied.txt. Uh, to, as sort of a bookkeeping method to keep track of all the patches that have gone into base.sql. Now, when we're ready to uh, apply new patches over to uh, a, a running instance, 
there's uh, an analogous table. You can't hardly see it here, but it's patches applied. It's just like the, the text file in the Git repository, but this is a regular Postgres uh, table that's keeping track of all the patches that have been uh, applied to this instance of the database. So uh, one thing that the, the, the patch software will do for us is take uh, the schema of the running database, uh, check and see which patches, uh, uh, you know, com it can compare the patches applied.txt file and the patches applied table to see which new patches would, would need to be added to this database. And it can do a dump of these things, sort of a hypothetical dump that, uh, that you would get if you took the existing schema and applied all these new patches. And if you compare that to base.sql, you should get the same thing, uh, assuming nobody's done any unauthorized changes to your database. So it's a way of, of checking and make sure nobody's been monkeying around when they shouldn't have. They should go through the, the patch mechanism and do it the way we've decided to, to do this. Not everybody likes that, by the way. Uh, Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the the procedure would be something like this: you you uh, you check out your Git repository, and and all the patches are, are in there. They've all been previously committed, but this patch software is built on. Um, Perl's module build is an extension of this module. And module build is a um, uh, software for managing uh, uh, the installation of modules normally. And in this case, we've just extended that to manage the, the installation of the, of the patches. Is it, does that answer your question? So, uh, um, and in addition to using module build, uh, we're using RoseDB uh, as the object relational mapper. And as I said, Mojalicious is a, a rather new Perl framework that has uh, gotten fairly popular in the last year. Okay, and um, I've also been working with Alex on some sort of monitoring tool for uh, our, our databases. And as he said, we've got around nine or 10 clusters. We've, there's several principal clusters that we have that we, we're really concerned when something happens though, but we've got a, a number of others. And um, what we'd like is kind of a simple tool that provides something like a weather forecast of, of how the, the clusters are doing. And so I created a little web app uh, using Mojalicious, since I've, I've been doing this development work uh, already on that that would uh, read a config file of um, a, a, a JSON formatted config file and, uh, and then throw, these, uh, throw this stuff up on a, on a screen, up on a, in, a, in a browser actually. And it just gives an icon for each uh, one of the clusters that are color coded to give an idea of how the thing is doing. And um, it's just a prototype right now, but um, We've got it reading the config file and, and throwing the stuff up on the screen. And it starts a JavaScript event loop that um, will also uh, create, a, create the SSH tunnels out to these, um, to these databases and then start doing various monitoring uh, operations. And that, that's the part where um, I'd love to have some feedback from people uh, because I'm not sure exactly what's the, the best things to be checking. I know there's various Unix commands. You can uh, check some stat tables. And if you see one of these guys go red or yellow, then you may want to click on it. In this case, I clicked on a green one, and uh, then it would give you uh, more information. Again, this is uh, um, it's a locally installed web application. These web applications you could create with Mojalicious are very light, so you could just check them out of a Git repository, and you can install it on your workstation in five minutes, and you don't have to bother the essays with root access or anything. And that's what we wanted, is something simple to, to monitor our databases. So uh, any suggestions? I'd love to hear them. Uh, and I guess that brings us to questions. 
It's, I, I don't have it posted anywhere, but I have it on our laptop, and I'll be glad to, to share it. This is something I kind of wrote in my own time, too. Uh, so some of the stuff we couldn't give out, like the, the module build patch stuff is kind of company stuff, but the monitoring tool has been my own little project. Um, yeah. Um, it's what they call it clustericious because uh, we, we have clusters of databases that uh, that um, process things and uh, the the guy who started module or actually what did the, the guy who who, uh, who started clustericious tried to release some other software and we just have a devilishly hard time of it uh, because we're actually contractors we're working for the government. And uh, they just put a mountain of red tape into trying to open source anything. Um, so we're, we're in a little bit of a bind on what we can release. So, anything else? Yeah. How do you store your uh, measurement data, your archives and apps, and how are they connected to the metadata? Good question. Uh, maybe we can go back. And Al Alex may want to jump in on this. Uh, that uh, I think he mentioned this back in. Are you talking about the data, the real data from the Sorry. real data from the instrument and uh, come down with the image or all that that volume of data? Exactly, this is real. This raw data. Yeah, those That's will there. be uh, uh, stored in the uh, stored in the archive. You know, we got. Hundreds of nook and you know for serving in different uh, data center and things like that. We we have a long history of the data, and those real data never move to database. Database only holding the metadata, which is describing a when when the new raw data we store the location and when we take apply with with the algorithm processing to what level. And we, how we classify what, uh, what ESDP, you know, we are grouping by so-called, we call it as an archive set, you know. And those information is a uh, metadata, which is uh, uh, in the database, is uh, searchable, all application point to that, and how we get access to uh, deliver the data, and also uh, our database tracking all the ordering status and all the processing, even planning when we process all the information in our database tracking. Well, we have another bit of software. Yes. But this is a huge amount of data which is stored in the archive. Yes. I, I just want to say that. How is this stored? Uh, this is the question. How is this stored? Uh, I can answer please, that. Do you set up the connections to your data? Well, uh, we have a, another piece of software that we wrote for this. It doesn't use a relational database. And uh, what it does, we got, as you said, there's millions of files that are constantly coming in from the satellite because it, it never rests. And um, we do an MD5 sum on those and uh, store them um, in a distributed uh, files, uh, file archive server uh, that can span across multiple servers. But the location is determined by the MD5 sum on the, um, on the contents of the file. So uh, you, you, you can easily just generate the address on the fly like that. Do you not use any uh, standard software like HDL5 or something like this? It's something self-written. Uh, it's self-written, but it's, it's not. Uh, I mean, we're still using a lot of Unix-type stuff. I mean, just do the MD5 sum and store it in a directory. That, uh, in a, and the directory structure is based upon that, that MD5 di uh, digest. So it's, it, it's generated by that, what, what you get back from that. So it's, it's not too complicated, really. Uh, the pr problem is because there's so many of them, as you said, and, and sometimes you have to rebalance the... Uh, the servers a bit so that one server doesn't have too many. Um, yeah, and we did have this in a database. It, for at one time, we were uh, storing the locations in a database, but we always had them uh, just as files. Yeah, I, um, 
So the, the web components mostly are, we work with uh, atmospheric scientists who process, who process the data after it comes in. And, and how does it? I think, I think they're talking about the front end, front end and back end. And the, how, how the data gets into the database is the, is the, is the internal uh, pro kind of monitoring. And you know, you're talking about front end. Uh, the, the important front end is uh, how do people know what stuff you have. Mm -hmm. And they have a big, a lot of application, even uh, other agency, other uh, scientists, they, they offer, they have their own project. They can write the application, uh, search engine, you know, based on, uh, as you see, I have previous slide is a data receiver. They can actually not only uh, go download a file that kind of user, they can, uh, you, you can develop a app, you know, um, target certain ozone data and things like that, and you can automatic, you know, getting the data when the new data come in, you know, pretty much we, we allow them to search, you know, order, staging it, they can write application and Harvesting those uh, output files, they can feed into the application. That's how, how the another way to deliver the data too. So there are uh, different kind of channels to deliver the data. Sure. Exactly. And is it a clustered file system that like any node can like how are you backing up? It sounds like the archive server is your goal and the PostgreSQL server could be probably repopulated if you have a iterated group. Like it sounds like that's the heart and soul of your project there. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, now for storing files, that is the heart and soul. And uh, um, there's a kind of a division of labor here that's that's created a little friction recently. So uh, our team wrote the software, the stuff that does the MD5 sum and stores the files. But uh, these SAs over at NASA are managing the hardware back there, and they can implement the, any kind of uh, RAID array or whatever disk system they want. And uh, recently, there was a problem, um, like files weren't going in fast enough. There was some delays, and there was a little bit of finger pointing. Well. You know, it, it didn't do this to you guys. Wrote this crazy software, and uh, but everything that you looked at tended to you, you tend to think that it was something wrong with uh, the disk. Um, it got resolved, but uh, I, I don't know much about the the hardware implementation, uh, and it's you know it could change uh, without our control. Our, our archives. Uh, I don't. Oh, m many terabytes. Uh, yeah. No, it's uh, well. Let's see. Oh, um, 2004 to to now for OMI. Uh, so there's been about eight years worth of data. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, you know the guy. The guy I worked closely with uh, wrote this this solution, and I, I think he uh, he thought it'd be kind of neat to write it himself in a way. But we, we already had something in place, and it was it wasn't quite right. And uh, not everybody agrees that we needed to write something ourselves, but but we did. And uh, and there was some clever stuff you put into it. But it uh, as I mentioned, that this is. Cause a little bit of friction. Um, Do you have an application? I'm sorry. Do you have an application? An application? Replication. Replication. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In the previous slide, we have a replication. We're using a machine that's a master and slave standby kind of replication. But this for the master. This is for the uh, metadata part, uh, database only. Uh, we don't have it. We don't have it. Uh, uh, this is just a raw data queue. We are storing in the in our archive server. Now you're talking about the metadata and the database. We do we do separately.
Okay, thank you all very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have any idea how large is the data that I have described? You're talking about the metadata. Yeah, so far, um, uh, one talk about, um, uh, about 25, around 25 gigs, one, 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 one database. We have two databases, and we're talking about close to about 50 gigs. For one time, for one time, uh, two, two database combined about, about 50 gigabytes, okay, five, five times. Okay. So I'm not sure that there's a good, good way to measure how big the database is. Great. Okay, thanks.